Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the A to Z Running podcast, where we help runners thrive. I'm Andy. And I'm Zach. For the next few weeks on the A to Z Running Podcast, we're going to talk about how to get the most out of running starting today by answering the question, how can runners train most efficiently? And three things that you want to think about while listening to this conversation will be, what does it really mean to build fitness? We're going to define that very simply and clearly for you. What's the difference then in impact between things like aerobic and anaerobic training? And finally, what is the most important Mm. and in addressing that we'll know what is most efficient so Mm -hmm. be sure to head to a to z running.com and click the word follow in the top right corner ish and subscribe on all of the places where you can subscribe so that you don't have to do the tedious work of finding us we'll come find you and give you our content hand delivered on a silver platter (laughs) Something like that, digitally on a silver platter. Uh, Fun. Okay, so we have a listener question. We love these. So thank you so much to those of you who have interacted with us on all the different platforms. We have one this week from Chelsea of May's Menu, and she asked us, what do we do for a cool down? And this is a hard question because I think it's different for most people. But first of all, when you're running a hard effort, you do want to run an actual like running cool down to help your heart rate come down from that very elevated state. And nice that- and easy hour or two jog. Nothing <laughs> crazy. He's kidding, although he has done that. He's I definitely done that. Didn't feel like that was a joke, but okay. some people have strange sense of humor. So sometimes after my runs for my post run routine, I will mobilize, do walking drills, some dynamic stretching. And on Instagram this week, I'll be posting just a little preview, but we're also putting like a more uh, integrated version on YouTube. So go to YouTube, check that out. It should be in the next couple days if it's not there already, but this will be my cool down routine. Again, this is runner's choice. You do the things that you need to do in order to you know stretch out better. So this is a great time with your muscles being really loose to mobilize. I'm not talking about like traditional stretching. I'm talking about like the walking drills and all of that. So some of the things I do, leg sweeps. I do flamingos, a walking side leg extension. I do like a standing hurdle and an iliacus stretch. So again, you don't need to know what all those are. Go ahead, find it on YouTube, or you can follow us on Instagram and get a little preview of it. And speaking of wanting to do things that help you recover and feel better, you should get your hands on some XO skin. That's a pretty good transition. That exactly. literally is XO followed by the word skin. So you've heard us talking about exoskin. Well, guess what? Now they are launching a new mid-compression short in the coming days. You heard it first here. And this new short is going to have an exclusive new knit structure with a two-way stretch waistband, which has never been done before in that like seamless apparel category of things. You know, the current thing is more like this four-way stretch. You know all about it. Well, the two-way stretch is coming soon to their mid-compression shorts, and it's going to be excellent. So you've got to get your hands on some of this stuff. Why do you say? Because first, it's made 100% in the USA, veteran-owned company. Second, every exoskin product uses a patented rapid-dry copper blend. That means that these materials do things for you like, well, they hate moisture and reduce friction, eliminating chafing very nearly in all aspects. Blisters, hot spots, all that stuff is gone. Natural antimicrobial as well. That's the thing with copper. And you've heard all about this if you've been I don't want him to be a stinky runner. So this is very good news to me. It's impossible to stop me from being a stinky runner. But if anything can do a decent job, it's this kind of stuff. So the Exoskin product, full line of apparel, including shirts. They've got these these arm sleeves that I really enjoy. I just got a pair. They've got shorts, tights, underwear. They've got all the good stuff that you need. Socks, toe socks, which Andy has been trying out for the first time. Blister free. Mm-hmm. And it is 
excellent compression stuff. Every product, by the way, is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. So that means you can, in fact, try it and decide for yourself. But you really don't need to decide for yourself because you trust us <laughs> and we tried it and have really been putting it to the test. Yeah. And it works. It's great. So because you trust us so much, you're going to go to xoskin.us. That is the letter X, the letter O, then skin.us. And you're going to use the code A to Z. That's A-T-O-Z for your 20% off discount, as well as to let them know how much you trust us. Because you do trust us. And you can trust us and, you know, still check things out for yourself. And there's that's why there's that 30 day money back guarantee again, A to Z. And I do want to mention a giveaway that I am doing on Instagram. So hop over on to Instagram. Uh, it's a Mother's Day, a fun thing. And it's actually for all women. So feel free to check it out. If you're a man on Instagram, you can enter. But you got to give the giveaway, the gift to a lady in your life. So. Check it out. Which you're probably scrambling to figure out what to do well, anyway. Well, I, I cannot <laughs> promise that it will ship in time for Mother's Day because mm. it will end on Wednesday. Well, if you're anything mm -hmm. like me, you're routinely familiar with giving things like IOUs and stuff like that for Mother's Day gifts. So if you give something's a letter that says something's coming, <laughs> it might not be outside the pattern. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, that was fun. Let's get on to the world of running. The world of running has some exciting news for you. We're going to start with the Trials of Miles Kansas City Qualifier. According to Trials of Miles on Instagram, Tona Tui Lopez won the 800-meter run in a world-leading time of 144.40, which is also the Mexican national record. Ooh, yes. that's fast. Super fast. That's fast. All right. So this uh, Kansas City Trials of Miles is similar to the one that we did in Austin. That's kind of part of that series. And so they've really been able to put together some good meets with mm -hmm. fast times. That's mm -hmm. exciting. Well, also on Saturday, May 1st, this time in Ethiopia was the Ethiopian Olympic Marathon Trials, although they didn't run a marathon for the trials. So it's a little bit confusing just to name the event that or at least for us to say the name of the event as that. They ran a 35K instead, which is, is a good idea given the timing because you really don't want athletes doing an all-out marathon not that many weeks before the Olympics. So 35K, a little bit lighter on the legs there. Um, and so the winner for the men's race, Shura Katata, won. And in that is not terribly surprising. He is also the one who won the recent London Marathon. Oh, you know, the okay. one where Kipchoge lost. Well... Katata won. That's the real story. So, and and he's he's yes, not that's uh, story. yes, uh, he's not foreign to the world marathon majors top end scene. He does have a a kind of uh, I don't want to use the word pedestrian here, but I'm comparing him against Kipchoge for a moment. Well, he has a slower PR, but that does not disqualify anyone from winning championship races nope. because as we know in the marathon, you don't have to have the fastest PR to win that day on that race. Mm -hmm. So he's run 204.49. We can expect uh, a solid performance from him in the Olympics. And he will be joined then, assuming nothing changes, because Ethiopia does not guarantee without a doubt that these three will be in the Olympics. But th they most likely are, based off of the qualifying. Um, and so he'll be joined then by Lelisa De Sisa and Sisse Lim Lima. And De Sisa, by the way, with a another similar PR, 204.45, also has a slew of world marathon majors wins. So he hasn't run the fastest marathons out there, but he's won the big ones when yeah. they count. Boston, New that York. That means something for sure. Definitely does. So he knows how to win. And then Lima, who was third in their trials, has the fastest PR of the three, a 203.36. Not quite as many accolades, but he's clearly been able to put down some fast times. So sure. we'll see. For the women, Tigist Girma won, and she uh, similarly has strong marathon performances uh, in fast times, but not as many world stage accolades. Mm. So that's always kind of an interesting question mark where you say um, she can run fast. Can she put it together for a big race like the Olympics? Mm. And we're going to find out. And then she'll be joined by Birhani Dibaba and Rosa de Rehe Bekele. And the three of them being a solid Ethiopian yeah. team because Dibaba, who has run 218.30-ish, not slow at all. <laughs> 
Also has a couple World Marathon Majors wins like Tokyo, some other top three finishes. She's a champ and Definitely. can put it together. And then Dereje Bekele also has a 218.30 personal best marathon with some several top three Marathon Majors finishes. So why do we spend as long as we do talking about Ethiopian marathon trials? Because the Ethiopian teams will be medal contenders. That doesn't mean every single one of them will, but they'll be in the race as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And we see medals from Ethiopians nearly every single time Mm -hmm. in these races. So now you've heard their names. So when you're watching the Olympics games, Mm -hmm. you'll know who people are talking about when they say them. Again, that's one of the reasons why we do the World of Running segment here on the A to Z Running Podcast is so that you can have more fun watching Mm -hmm. running and being part of the sport of running. So Very exciting people to watch out for. I do need to mention, because I know at least someone named Benjamin is going to comment at some point on (laughs) our stuff and say, hey, you still didn't talk about Bekele, meaning Kenanisa Bekele. Um, Yes, so officially, Kenanisa Bekele is not on the Olympic team for Ethiopia. And why that matters, because he's, you know, the second fastest marathoner ever. He's run two seconds slower than Kipchoge's world record. So that means something. Um, also, he's held like every other world record out there. Um, just doesn't point. just doesn't anymore, which is <laughs> yeah. crazy. Um, Cheptegay is to blame for that. But anyway, Bekele, no, he's not currently to be on the team on the roster. But that doesn't necessarily mean he is officially out. Uh, the The word is that he won't be at the Olympics, but we'll see. You yeah. never know exactly because these things don't have to be set in stone. Mm. Very interesting stuff. Yeah. Exciting summer to come. So. I have a world record for you, and I'm excited to share it, Uh, but it's not an official one. Mm. (laughs) So we'll see if it's ratified. It's unlikely, but still exciting because it's a very fast performance. That was a 5K women's road record in Norway. Caroline Govidal ran 14.39. Now, she specializes in the 3K and steeplechase, and she's won European bronze medals over like the steeplechase as well as the 10K. And this time, this 1439 is two seconds faster than Beth Potter's that we mentioned on the podcast. Also unofficial. Unofficial <laughs> that we talked about on the podcast a couple a couple weeks ago. And that was 1441. So this is unlikely to be mm. ratified as well. The current official record is held by um, Beatrice uh, Keptic- Keptic- um And that happened this February. And her time was 1444. So many have commented about this. Why Why does it seem like suddenly people are breaking this record constantly? Um, and simply the reason is because they only started keeping the record like two years ago, if you recall the last time we mentioned this with Beth Potter. So it, it's going to happen quite a bit, people breaking this record at the moment, uh, because there are many very fast 5K women who have run way faster than this time, mm-hmm. this record time. Just don't do it on the roads. Um, but it's also hard to find sanctioned road 5Ks that you can actually – are records legal. There's just not that many of them. So when these types of people can run these kinds of times, it's great. The question is when will they do it on a sanctioned race mm-hmm. with others who are also running those kinds of times because then it gets crazy. Now, this is a breakthrough race. We'll get on to some more news in just a second. But I, I do want to say that her previous best on the roads was 15.04. Oh, yeah. And she's 30 years old. And she had a, this massive breakthrough. Like, that is huge. 25 seconds is no small thing in a 5K. No. It was more than that, wasn't it? 25 seconds oh, 25 seconds so okay. <laughs> excellent stuff there and and who knows who knows what uh this means for the future of these kinds of things but we'll see these records officially fall certainly soon mm-hmm. also on saturday may 1st that was a day for records it seems uh this time jumping ship all the way to the very far distances and in morton illinois at the season's gastro pub on a treadmill for 100 miles of running <laughs> <laughs> taggart van etten 25 years old from illinois ran a new 10 100 mile treadmill world record Woo. wow that's all I want to say about that. Andy, you can give the details. Okay, so he beat the previous record that was held by Zach Bitter um, by 37 minutes. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. And the average for his pace was 6.56 per mile for 100. 
hundred miles. Wow. So who had Sad. more fun? Taggart on the treadmill for eleven hours and change. What is it? Eleven hours fifty thirty two minutes? Or the people spectating at the gastro pub. Hopefully they were getting a discount on their drinks and at the same time watching this insane guy run for nearly twelve hours straight. I bet they had a blast. Yeah. They also put a second treadmill in the room with him just in case anyone wanted to keep him company. And I'm very curious if anyone did because yeah. the article did not say. That would be curious. I bet he had it planned that a few people would come and join him. You, I would think so. You got to hope because yeah. what else do you do for 12 hours of running? So speaking of records, previous held by American Zach Bitter. <sighs> There was a couple more that happened in the UK. The 12 hour and the 100 mile record broken. Now, this one was on a track, so there's a differentiation there. So, this new world record holder is Lithuanian ultra runner uh, Sanya Sorkon. And um, it's really curious how this whole thing happens. Like, they do it on a track, and he was just clipping away, like, really great pacing through this whole thing some people get kind of like um, tired and bored of that but he (laughs) seemed to thrive under these conditions Uh, that's at least what uh, Canadian news told us so yeah (laughs) pretty crazy I don't think it's possible to thrive under those conditions but oh well he did (laughs) that was a joke yes Excellent stuff. So we've got one final note here, which is some Olympic news updates. Um, Yes, Japan has been hard at work trying to keep everyone informed about what exactly to expect here. And as you know, with the nature of these things, things change and can change very easily. But the word currently is that some limited domestic spectators may be allowed. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Limited domestic. Some okay, limited yeah. domestic spectators may be allowed. No international. So the what they're talking about right now is the protocols for athletes, coaches, and so, some of those kinds of things. The ones who will be traveling internationally, but not really many spectators, certainly not international spectators. Right. And those Everybody athlete protocols. No to right. Those athlete protocols, those coach protocols and things like that will be pretty serious stuff, too. So yeah. they're really trying hard to make sure that nobody shows up anywhere with other people if COVID may be present. Absolutely. That's kind of it. Let's go to our main topic. How can runners train most efficiently is the question that we are about to answer and is the first of a series. So what we're really trying to do here is we've we've been reflecting on at this point in time, most of you are starting to think even more about things like races and how to get ready for races, how to execute things well so that you can feel good and be ready to run fast, all that kind of stuff. So you want to get the most out of your running. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that you never did before, but we tend to all feel seasonal priorities with these kinds of things. And this is a season that many of us find prioritizing some of our running. Absolutely. And also we have that question of efficiency. We all want to know like, what are the things that are most important? Because we don't have time to do like everything under the sun. So we need to know like what matters most. And when we're making decisions about our training, it's good to keep in mind the things that will help us the very most. In the sage words of a wise West Michigan high school teacher, when time and resources are limited, We benefit ourselves immensely by focusing on what matters most Hmm. or something like that. And I don't know exact words that he said. Um, And what we want to do then here is navigate through a series of questions to address this most efficiency and training thing. Before we can answer that, we really need to set the stage here. And that begins with the question of what is fitness? Because... Mm-hmm. most efficiency has to do with how we're building our fitness. So then we have to know exactly what we mean when we say we're trying to build fitness. It is not as simple as saying, I want to be running better. <laughs> it doesn't work that way because fitness actually has a few key component parts. Mm-hmm. So if I could break those up for you in very simple phrases, uh, one is the energy systems. So the effectiveness of your energy systems, and I'm saying that plurally because there really are kind of like three, uh, these blend into each other a bit, but if we could differentiate them clearly, your aerobic, your anaerobic, and the alactic systems. Now, as a distance runner, you're probably not paying any attention to your alactic system. 
which is like sprinting. Um, but the aerobic and anaerobic are highly important to you, especially aerobic. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the second aspect then of building fitness is like the muscle strength and mobility. One like Steve Magnus, for instance, could say something like biomechanical operations. That's good stuff. Um, and then the last one is the actual neurological activity, like neuromuscular interactions mm -hmm. as a part of fitness. Yeah, those are things like strides and doing drills. Ah, yes. And so the good ways of building your neuromuscular activity. So Steve Magnus wrote about this, as it were, in his book, The Science of Running, which is an excellent read. It should never be your first read in running science because it is too heavy for a first read but it's great if you've been exploring science running running science a bit and you want something a little bit uh it would really take you all in that's a good one so all of these things together total efficiency as steve magnus defines it is running economy which is the combination of all of the above or we could just say building fitness so then the question that we naturally lead from here is if building fitness is growing all of those things, the biomechanical, the neural, neuromuscular, and the energy systems, if that is building fitness, then what among those things matters most? Mm. Which is That's the number one question we have here. <laughs> that's the question. Um, but here's, here's the complicated dynamic before I even address that is in trying to ask the question what matters most, then we're begging the essentially the one of two things is it more important to then focus on what matters most in exclusion to the other things or at least some degree of neglect of them or is it more important in identifying what matters most to really aspire toward a balance of all of those things to build fitness um, and that's an important question here because otherwise the what matters most really doesn't make a difference if you're just going for balance anyway. And so you might be able to guess that we're going to answer that question simply by saying it's probably better to focus most of your attention on the one thing that matters most and possibly neglect to some degree the others. And I'm going to lay this out in simple terms for you here in a moment. But uh, the, the problem here is most conventional running plans that you see out there today take on this more kind of balanced approach where they essentially say, you know, a little bit of everything and you're growing it over time and all this kind of stuff. Um, and according to the science, that is not effective. <laughs> so if you have been following plans like that for years and years and you're asking yourself the question of what can I do to take the next step, the first recommendation I have is abandon the balanced approach plan. Try something different. Take the risk because the science tells you you will get better. Now, what is that science? What does that mean? Um, so here's the what matters most. And you already know what it is because you've listened to us and you trust us. And because you trust us, when you're listening to us, you know when we say things like aerobic capacity and aerobic condition is the most important thing for a distance runner to do, then you know that that's what we're about to say here. So yeah. in order to build your fitness, you need to grow your aerobic capacity because you are not a sprinter. And everything outside of sprinting involves your aerobic capacity almost predominantly. Mm -hmm. And the example Andy will give in a little while, uh, she'll talk about 5K running and racing during marathon training. And why is it that so many run 5K PRs during marathon training? Fascinating. More to come on that in a moment. So back to aerobic capacity for a second. Why does aerobic capacity matter most is really an important question to address here before we get on to then how to go about that. Um, because everyone writes about this stuff. Everyone who writes about running talks about aerobic, anaerobic, and some element of the, those kinds of things involved. First, I want to go to Keith Livingstone. So Dr. Keith Livingstone, who got his research predominantly through the lens of Arthur Lydiard. And so you and that's know. why you love him. <laughs> yes. You know And because he's, you know, a scientist. You right. Know. Smart. We talk about Lydiard a fair bit here because we have found as we look through all of the stuff out there that it's hard to find a single thing on modern running that isn't influenced by Lydiard. And so that always in my mind means go to the source. You know, you can look at all the stuff, but go to the source um, and then look at what's what's new and updated. So Dr. Livingstone helped to kind of clarify a lot of what Lydiard was talking about before he even had the science words in his vocabulary, but still knew what to do. Very intuitive coach out there. Anyway, um, so Livingstone says in Healthy Intelligent Training, which is the book I would recommend for a first read 
in running science. So if you haven't read anything about running science, pick up this book. It will set you on the right path. And what he says is that aerobic capacity is the majority of your fitness. And by majority, he's really looking at it's it's somewhere in the vicinity of like nearly 80% of your fitness capacity is the aerobic stuff, no matter what distance you're racing as a distance runner. And so naturally, we should devote a fair bit of our time to that. But the reason why the aerobic capacity is the, the most important thing to devote that time and attention to is because it also grows slowly. So it takes a fair bit of time to build it well. It grows more slowly than all the rest of the things involved in your fitness, um, as well as it influences those other things as well. So your aerobic capacity's height has a lot to do with then what you can be in anaerobic capacity and such. Um, so all of this, if I'm not going into the science, which I'm not trying to give you too many things to throw at you right now, but all of this suggests that aerobic capacity, which is the oxygen moving system, that's the one that we have to have developed well to achieve our best possible success in running. And so, <laughs> <laughs> what then do we do about that? Uh, so we know aerobic capacity is the essential piece, but then the, the question that we wanted to answer here is what's the most efficient way mm -hmm. to build that fitness, to train well? And that's, that's actually a fairly easy question to answer, believe it or not, uh, because the, the fundamental answer to aerobic capacity is volume counts. As a matter of fact, volume counts the most at first. And certainly over the course of time, volume is going to have the greatest effect. So we need to be running as, as much as we reasonably can to a limit. There is a limit, and it is a very different limit for every person. I can attest to that. Andy has talked a number of times about how her, her maximum aerobic running that she can do in a week is not necessarily the same as others um, in order to stay healthy. And that tends to be true for everyone. So we, we shouldn't all hear someone say things like 100 miles a week and say, well, I need to go do that um, because that's not necessarily the right answer. But the point is a high volume of good quality aerobic running matters because that happens to be just about the easiest way to safely and healthily build our oxygen system. And if I were to just simply reference Livingstone again here briefly, he talks a lot about the just in our muscles, the building the capillary beds. So as I was reading Steve Magnus's book, again, The Science of Running, um, I found that as he was trying to describe this, we're really talking about how well our heart can get blood through our body and that blood carrying oxygen with it effectively. And it has a lot to do with the combination of things like the stroke volume, you know, how much blood your heart can simply pump and how well then the blood diffuses through the muscles, which has to do with the capillary beds in the muscles. This is what was so fascinating to me. You all love it when I talk about science. I just know it. So... <laughs> Yes, I think so. What it, what it amounts to is the comfortable aerobic running, long volumes of comfortable aerobic running, build your capillary beds in your muscles really well. That's one of the most common adaptations that occurs after running aerobically for a substantial period of time. But by running too fast, then what you're doing is depleting the glycogen stores in your body, which is fine to do except that it takes a while to restore them and so you can't do that too often because then you'll just simply run out of all glycogen stores and you'll end up in some state of massive fatigue eventually it's not good and so what you have to do is you have to find the balance of how much long easy running and how much a little bit faster up tempo running can i do in a given week to most effectively build my fitness which we're talking about growing your aerobic capacity here and the answer is <laughs> i don't know um th this is one of the for most every difficult person it's i'm literally right? saying i don't yeah. know on purpose here because um as steve magnus notes so many times throughout all of his work this is actually a very understudied anomaly in running like just, there's just not much information people have actually proven on the topic but intuitively coaches have found a fair degree of what works best and intuitively there's a general trend but then individually it needs to be implemented to the most optimal fine tuning and that's very difficult to do so i'll give you the just the general trend uh, because it's no surprise here that we probably want to be doing two or three harder runs 
that are not quite as long in volume in a given week. And by pace, we should look for somewhere in the vicinity of sub-threshold running, which some talk about it as marathon-type effort. Some call it steady state, which is the way Lydiard and Livingstone describe it. Um, and some also just say sub-threshold, which, which makes sense because threshold is where you're starting to move into that aerobic shifting to anaerobic area. Can I so, say this is not actually marathon pace? Marathon effort is different than marathon pace. Yeah. yeah. Um, all efforts are different than paces. Yeah. And, and that's an impossible conversation to have with most people. And, and I'm talking about even like between the two of us, it's so difficult to talk about effort versus pace because we always cue like an effort translates to a certain pace, right? And the answer is yes, given the conditions given your immediate state of fitness given your recent amount of sleep hydration and nutrition so no pace doesn't work can i give can i give an example yes okay please. so during my chicago build where i chicago is where i ran the 243 45 i was running for my steady state runs probably like 620s so I was not running marathon pace. And like some days I was running 640s for steady states. I, I kind of ran anywhere in between there. But then, of course, I was ready on the day of Chicago to run faster. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to give you an example, a real life example of steady state and how like that effort, um, it translated to something faster on race day because I was then peaking ready for my race. Yeah, and so that, that that's got to be true in all things training. You should never expect, and we, we've said this very recently, and we say it constantly on the podcast here, uh, but especially in conversations with our athletes, you should never expect on you know day 10 of a, let's say, 100-day training block, you should never expect on day 10 to be running in training the pace that you want to be able to do on day 100 of your race. Exactly. Yeah. And some people say, well, that doesn't make any sense because I'm training for that race. I need to be able to run that pace. And so it seems counterintuitive. And the one training approach that is totally wrong, but is one way that people try to address this is they say, okay, well on day 10, you just run two miles at that pace. And on day 100, you're going to run 26, right? Well, yeah, that does make sense. Except then you're only running two miles. Well, at you're not training pace. your system. <laughs> you're your not systems, training yeah. your system. You're just simply training your neurological combination to run that pace really well or really familiarly. Familiarly? Familiarly. Well, anyway, <laughs> so the point here is pace is not a determining factor for what you should do on a day. Pace is simply an output of what happened based off the effort you gave that day. And if you can always look at it that way, then you can always aspire toward the most necessary training that your body can give for the desired effort on a day. And another simple example, because Andy mentioned hers, which is a really clear example. Uh, Barry McGee talks all the time in, in the books and interviews that he's done and certainly in conversation with me as he's coaching me that um, he'll do an eight block conditioning cycle with an athlete, right? And that athlete, he would like that athlete to be running something like maybe 10 miles in 55 minutes. This is an example he always gives. So if the thought is that athlete should probably be fit enough to run 10 miles in 55 minutes before moving on to the next thing, then the first week he would like that athlete to be running that 10 miles in 62, 63 minutes. And that just sounds mm. great. And then the next week, eh, maybe it's still, still about 62 minutes. The week after that, you might be closer to 60, 61. And after eight weeks of training, he wants to see the athlete running 55 minutes for 10 miles. So clearly... If you want to get to a certain point at a later date, you should never expect to be at that point at an earlier date, or you either need to amend your goals, which may be possible, and that's great because it means you're in much better shape than you thought and the training is going well, or you just simply need to address the fact that I need to give the right amount of effort and I'll find out when I'm done how fast that was, and the next time I'll try to give the same right amount of effort and hope for a general positive trend toward higher fitness slowly over time. That was a little bit of a detour, but the <laughs> but it's point, an important one. It's, it's an, an important, important detour. So, so if I can summarize, I guess I, I should summarize right now because we really kind of stated the meat of this, 
which is that the most efficient way to grow fitness is to address the aerobic capacity and address it in a high quality manner. But when we're talking about efficiency, the problem here is that it takes time to do this well. And so there are truly no shortcuts. And that's, I want to say that because it's one of the rules. I'm going to tell you this straight out. It's one of the rules of distance running is that you need to try to avoid the shortcut mentality. Um, because so long as you're trying to find the shortcuts, you're likely to miss the more important things. Mm -hmm. So even though our conversation here is about efficiency, which is kind of like shortcuts, um, you have to have the long game mindset here. And if I could say, because I don't want to totally discount the point of like the balanced approach to training, which has tons of merit, uh, because if all of those things mean building fitness, then, you know, growing all of those things means you'll be fitter. Um, but what we find is that aerobic capacity is the hardest and longest thing to grow within those categories. And then when you talk about like biomechanical and neurological, those things are actually fairly easy to positively mm -hmm. influence quickly mm -hmm. in small bits of time. Have you ever noticed when you start doing a workout, the first one is terrible, but like by the third one, like you feel like you're in the groove again. That's because you're, you're easily adapting. Whereas with aerobic fitness, of course, like Zach has been saying, it takes a lot more time. And now I don't want to graze over the fact that for the near muscle, muscular activation and some of these mobility things, those might be more important than um, getting a couple extra miles in for your aerobic mm -hmm. volume because staying healthy is the number one goal. Getting to the starting line is the number <laughs> one goal. So putting all these things in perspective, but knowing that aerobic fitness, if you're looking at doing interval training or you're looking at doing a long steady run go for that steady run yeah yeah andy's right there's there's an underlying consideration that goes with all things training which is simply that consistency over time so what do we say you know good training building fitness is all about intelligently implementing quality training over time right and the overtime thing only happens if you stay healthy and so as a consequence, you can't do something that would jeopardize your health, but you also need to look to the path of what are the things that are going to most effectively grow my fitness and focus in in that sense. So it's not a simple thing. You probably set out on listening to this conversation looking for some simple answers because efficiency sounds like it should be quick and easy, but it's not, which is why <laughs> it's not a bad idea to read the books. We always talk about be a student of the sport. Don't just be a, a, a connoisseur of the fads. Be a student of the Which sport. Which you are doing by listening to this podga podcast, most yeah. likely. So you're coming for information. So there you go. And because <laughs> you trust us, you are going to check out and read certainly Keith Livingstone's Healthy Intelligent Training so that you can really grow your own studiousness. Um, and it's a good read, Steve Magnus's uh, The Science of Running. However, it's a difficult read if you're not already familiar with some of these concepts because um, he's just super sciencey, which yeah. is awesome. He loves the science. <laughs> and then after reading a book or two about this stuff, you're going to come back to us and you're going to say, I'm thinking about your coaching services right now <laughs> and wondering what, or you're just going to send us an email and say, I just have this question and I'm just curious if you would share some thoughts because you don't have to subscribe to our coaching services in order for us to answer your questions because mm -hmm. we love to do that too. Yeah. And we'll be linking to the books that we've mentioned in our podcast episode. You can find that at a to z running.com. So before we leave, I did want to tell that 5K story, Zach. <laughs> so my best 5K was during marathon training. In fact, I had done no speed workouts yet. I like literally was coming from base building yep. <laughs> into this. And and I hadn't done some of those volumes before. And it was a really positive thing for me to feel that strong during my race, indicating that aerobic fitness does you know, help us achieve some of those goals for running faster. And, and, you know, everyone has, has a different idea of what times are fast and whatever, but, um, I ran 1725, I believe, mm -hmm. um, for that run before my marathon, which was an 11 second PR over a previously 20 second, uh, no 30 second PR from six months before that. Both of those simply influenced the one difference being a focus on aerobic training and, this coming from Andy, who had been c competing aggressively and training aggressively for 12 years mm -hmm. 
prior to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. (laughs) Good stuff. Well, so check us out if you're not already a follower because you definitely want to get this kind of high quality content (laughs) delivered directly to you so that you don't have to come seek it out. So subscribe on YouTube, on the podcast places, head to adzrunning.com, click the word follow, and then you'll hear more from us on the topic of how to focus your running on what matters most. Mm-hmm. And thank you all for listening. And that being said, we thank you for taking your time, for putting us in your ears, for watching us on YouTube. We know there's there's a lot of podcasts out there, so we are honored that you'd share your time with us. And that you trust us so much. <laughs> thank you for joining us. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>